And now I'm really excited to introduce our guest speaker, Stephanie Ellis. And I know that many of you know Stephanie really well. Um, Stephanie has been involved with the uh, SFBBO for much longer than I have. She started off as our outreach person. Um, and then since then, she has served in leadership positions here and other organizations. She was our interim executive director here at SFBBO. She was also the executive director at the Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society. And then she moved back, back east and is the executive director of the nonprofit Wild Care. Um, and I am just really thrilled that Stephanie is able to continue to participate with SFBBO remotely. And her talks are always really popular. Um, and I'm excited to, to learn about the life in the egg that she's going to share with us tonight. So thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Um, I'm talking today tonight about one of my most favorite topics on the planet. And I love SFBBO. So this is perfect. Um, I also need to tell you all that we just, um, we are having a really intense storm, I think the tail end of Hurricane Ian. And so about 40 minutes ago, I lost my power and my internet, <laughs> which sent me into a panic, um, but it seems to be okay now. But if I disappear, I'm going to use my hotspot to come back. Um, so anyway, welcome. I'm so excited. So... Um, interestingly, when I first put this talk together, it's while I was living in California and I was doing work with SFBBO and um, the Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society. So many of my photos are actually from SFBBO or from people who you know who do bird conservation work and photography in the Bay Area. Um, so the first thing I wanted to start with um, to talk about how eggs are produced and how chicks develop within the eggs, we first need to talk about uh, the reproductive anatomy of birds and how birds actually reproduce. Um, so I'm going to start with a pigeon, which everyone knows and um, many people love, some people do not, <laughs> but beautiful birds nonetheless. And so this is an illustration of a female rock pigeon. And so some important structures here uh, in birds. Um, so most living birds only have one oviduct. And this is where eggs are produced. This is um, a really important structure. And you can see here that there's a vestigial right oviduct in most species of birds. And that is because if birds had two oviducts, um, it would, they would weigh an enormous amount. It would be prohibitive to flight. Um, and also they would have the possible problem of laying, you know, producing and laying two eggs at once. And so because of this, um, most living birds have lost one oviduct. And so when birds produce an egg, they produce one egg at a time. And it makes sense really when you think about it. And so um, I also want to point out that in female birds, so this is the ovary and all these little grape-like clusters. Um, those are the ovum. And basically what they are is the yolk as we know it. And so we're going to talk about how the, the yolk actually comes down the oviduct and um, becomes the full egg with the membranes and the shell. But so for now, um, so this is the ovary and these little follicles are the ovum or the yolk. And also important is um, the ureters. And this is how um, the urates from birds are transferred from the kidneys to the cloaca. And I'm sure many of you, a lot of you are probably bird people, bird brains. And so the cloaca is where um, basically eggs are laid, um, the poop comes from the cloaca, and also the urates, which is, um, you know, the pasty urine component from a bird. So I know it's a lot of information, but it's really important for this talk. And so um, this is all so, so important to egg production. And so, and I apologize for this graphic photo, but it shows it in detail what the female reproductive system looks like. This was from a red-tailed hawk that I had done a necropsy on. And you can see again, those little grape-like cluster, clusters. These are the ovum. You can see um, the, the yolks there. These are the kidneys. Um, and so that's what it looks like um, in person. So now looking at the male avian reproductive tract, and again, this is an illustration of a pigeon. And so um, they have, birds have three lobed kidneys, 
and you have the ureter here. Again, birds don't produce urine as we do as mammals. They don't produce um, the ammonia, and we'll, we'll talk about why later. Um, but interestingly, so male birds do have um, testes, just not as we know them, um, but the testes are actually located up much higher near the kidneys here um, compared with the cloaca, which is where they poop from. And you can see here that a male bird, their testes actually will enlarge 100 times or greater when they are in reproductive um, condition. So hormones will kick in and birds come into condition to breed and this stimulates the gonates to enlarge in a huge way, um, which you can, ima can imagine if, if the gonads stayed that size, that would be preclusive to flight because males would be very, very heavy year round. So this typically just happens um, just before and during the breeding season. And then, you know, birds that are migrating, um, their gonads will shrink in size and then they're ready to continue um, the rest of their year or their migration. So really interesting. Also, probably most of you know that birds have a very high body temperature. And so we're looking at, you know, anything from 100 to 108 um, for birds like a hummingbird, especially a hummingbird in flight. And so to store semen, um, birds do not, male birds don't store semen in their testicles, which are located deeper into the body. Instead, they actually store them down here, a little pouch um, that is part of the cloaca, and that's called a seminal vesicle. And so that's interesting. I'm going to show you what that looks like when um, male, a male songbird, for example, is in breeding condition and his seminal vesicle is full. And um, the reason for that is because uh, the temperature here is actually much lower for storing sperm. You know, it's almost external to the body rather than storing it, storing it way up here in the body cavity where it would be much warmer and wouldn't allow sperm to survive. And, and I promise you that my entire presentation is not this technical, <laughs> but we're getting through the technical stuff in the beginning. Um, so what about, you know, I haven't shown you a bladder, and that's because no living birds except for ostriches have bladders. Um, birds actually produce, their feces are um, like nitrogenous waste, it's uric acid crystals, and this is because um, urine, as we have, has to, um, we take a lot of water in um, so that we can excrete it, and ammonia can build up into our body. And so birds, they don't have the option of storing uh, excess water um, and ammonia could build up to toxic levels in their body and especially in within an eggshell. And so instead, instead of storing all this water and drinking all this water and then having to pee all the time, um, they pass these urates, which are basically like a pasty, the pasty white, stuff that you see on your car in the morning from the birds, basically. And we will talk about that more because it's crit critically important when you're talking about eggshells and the developing chicks. Um, so just really, really interesting. So birds don't have a bladder, except ostriches, they are, you know, one of the, the largest or, or maybe the largest non-flighted bird. And so they can have a bladder, they can drink water, they don't have to get up off the ground, so they can drink tons of water and have a bladder um, that is, you know, holding them down weight-wise, it doesn't matter. And then the renal portal system is um, basically, um, birds share this with reptiles, and so blood is circulating um, through the lower half of the body in a different way than it does in mammals. And we don't have to get into that, um, but only so you know, as a rehabber, if we are giving injections to birds, we are not going to give injections in the lower half of the body because we know that that medication will go through the kidneys first, which could sometimes lead to an overdose or could be toxic to the kidneys. And so birds function differently in this way, and that is related also to um, not producing urine and to producing uh, uric acid. They want to be more efficient um, and they have solid waste. 
um, and a vasectomy, it actually is possible in birds. And some people do this in, you know, their male uh, pigeons and parrots. Um, and you can vasectomize a bird. It's easier than ovariectomies. Um, but as you can imagine, all of these structures are very, very small compared with, say, a mammal. And so very delicate procedures. I always love to point that out because it can be done. And so this is an awesome SFBBO photo from the Coyote Creek Field Station of what a cloacal protuberance looks like. So this is the example I was saying uh, when songbird males are in a breeding full breeding condition and they have sperm in that seminal vesicle, this is what it looks like. So at a glance, we would know that this is a breeding male who is basically ready to go. Um, that's filled with sperm. It looks like a little pimple or maybe an abscess, but it's actually totally normal during the breeding season. Okay, and I really hope that there are not any children on this talk because now we're about to get into how birds do it. And I like to refer to this as pornithology. And forgive me, Kristen, I hope Kristen invites me back. <laughs> and Serena. Um, so these are two common turns, and I'm sure you have all heard of the phrase cloacal kiss. So we were talking about the cloaca, which is where the eggs and the poop and the urates come out. Well, that's also how there is a transfer of semen into the female's oviduct. So what happens is most birds do not have a penis-like structure. So what happens is those two cloacas come together for us for seconds in some occasions. They evert so that there's a connection and so that the sperm will transfer into the female's oviduct. And we refer to this as a cloacal kiss. Sometimes, you know, depending on the species, don't blink because you may have missed it. <laughs> and so here's what it looks like often, a twisting of a tail. It's usually preceded um, and followed by courtship behaviors or bathing. Um, and it's really cool to watch, even though you might feel like a voyeur. Um, those are such great photos. And then I love showing this. You all have the fabulous snowy plovers on your coast, and we have the piping plovers. And um, so some birds are cute with their reproductive strategies, and piping plover rhymes with lover, and I feel like that's intentional. <laughs> um, but some birds are actually really well endowed. So um, there are some species of birds, and there are some groups of birds that have evolved penises. They don't look anything like penises of mammals, but they've developed these phalluses, and the ostrich takes the cake, wins the prize for the largest phallus in the bird world. So the ostrich has a phallus of 15.7 inches when it is erect, and it is bright red, and it, it leans to the left, and I almost put a photo into this presentation, and then I chose not to, but please Google ostrich penises. And then I'm sorry for any ads that you might get after you do that. <laughs> um, but anyway, you might be wondering, well, you know, only 3% of all birds in the world have penises. So why? Well, for the ostrich, they are actually a highly promiscuous species. The male and the female both take many, many mates. And so you can imagine that having a penis that is allowing for actual um, penetration for some degree would help to facilitate sperm transfer, sperm transfer in tricky, sticky situations. Um, the other birds that have penises are um, your waterfowl. And when you think about their lifestyle, waterfowl are mating in water. And so imagine if you're doing that cloacal kiss in water, you might lose sperm during the transfer because you're underwater. And so having a penis in waterfowl actually facilitates the, the sperm transfer underwater. It totally makes sense. And let me just check. I wrote myself some quick cheat sheets. Ducks, geese, swans, ostriches, and emus. Um, they have penises. And recently it was finally figured out, you know, how, how did the, the penises become erect? because it's not happening. Scientists had determined it was not happening by the blood vascular system like in mammals. And they finally just learned a few years ago that it's actually a burst of lymphatic fluid that is causing these penises to be erect. And then the males can penetrate um, the females. 
And I did, I chose this photo because it's not as graphic as looking at the ostrich penis, but for the waterfowl, you know, again, facilitating sperm transfer underwater, their penises tend to be corkscrew shaped. And you can see this here. And I'm not sure what's going on with this duck because you should never see a duck's penis unless you are watching them reproduce on water. The only time I get to see duck penises is um, we do see that with a certain parasites, um, trauma, spinal trauma. And so it's usually not a good thing if I, if I receive a duck or any type of waterfowl that has the phallus hanging out. So I'm not sure what's going on with him. I hope he had just mated. But you can see here the corkscrew um, and it looks uh, swollen with lymphatic fluid. Okay, so now you know how birds mate in a, in a nutshell or in an eggshell, I should say. <laughs> and so let's talk about the nitty gritty of how eggs are actually formed and how this all happens. And this is what I find absolutely the most fascinating. So here is, oops, here is the female's oviduct, the illustration. And so here's the cloaca. So what happens is they mate, there's the cloacal kiss, and the sperm actually travels up the oviduct, which is convoluted here, it's twisty, up the oviduct, and then it's stored um, up here near what we call the infundibulum, the top part of the oviduct. And some species of birds can store um, eggs for long periods of time, like ducks can actually store um, sperm for over 30 days, which is incredible. Also considering their body temperature, I don't know how that is not preclusive, um, you know, to the eggs actually being viable, but it's incredible. So what happens is um, what birds ovulate, and when they ovulate, a yolk, which is also the egg, it pops into this infundibulum region of the oviduct. And so that's going to happen whether the egg is fertilized or not. And this is why for those of you who have backyard chickens and don't have any male, you don't have any roosters, birds don't have to mate to produce eggs. They just need appropriate nutrition and appropriate daylight periods and they will produce eggs. And so it pops into the ophundibulum and um, infundibulum and basically it's in there for about 30 minutes and then it is moved into this magnum region of the oviduct. And what happens here is typically um, the yolk is within the magnum for about three hours and it starts receiving coatings of albumin, which we'll talk about when we talk about the contents of the egg. Um, but these are the inner portions of the egg surrounding the yolk. So those clear and white, whitish portions that you see when you crack open your breakfast egg. Then the uh, yolk, it travels into the isthmus region, which is here. And um, it's typically there for about one hour. And this is when it gets an albumin coating um, and the shell membranes start to be deposited onto the egg. And this is really important because the shape of the egg is actually determined by the membranes that are deposited. So those membranes, when you crack open your egg, and I have some photos, um, you know, those, those are actually pulling on the egg in different ways. And they're very um, vascular. So um, they're very breathable. And so genetics determine what the shape of the egg is going to be based on the lifestyle of the bird. But it's really the membranes that will dictate what that shape is. And so that's really interesting. We're gonna talk about that more too. So you can see these things are happening pretty rapidly. Um, but then what takes the longest time is that the egg then pops into the uterus and this is where it stays for about 20, hour, 20, 20 to 24 hours and receives the rest of its membranes, the shell, and also the pigments. And so while it's in the uterus, the egg is turning. The uterus is um, muscular and this con there's um, contractual movement and the egg is turning. And then based on genetics, there are these little um, glands that are secreting pigments. And depending on how fast or how slow the egg is turning in the uterus, uh, that dictates what the pattern will be. 
So for example, a grackle that has sort of spots and scrawling, that's an egg that's moving really slowly. Whereas um, the dots that you see on a lot of eggs, those patterns, often the egg is moving more quickly. And again, that's dictated by genetics based on the bird's uh, natural history, how they breed, where they breed, et cetera, et cetera. And so a typical egg, if looking at a chicken, for example, it will take them 24 hours to produce an egg. And so you can see it's a lot of work um, and there's a lot of nutrients that's that are going into these eggs. So this is why birds don't produce um, more eggs at one time or produce eggs more quickly, typically. Um, and thinking about eggs, have you ever cracked open a breakfast egg and have had two yolks in it? Um, there's nothing wrong with that. There's a one in 1,000 chance of that happening. But basically what it is, is it's just a glitch in ovulation. You saw how the yolk pops out of the infundibulum and goes into the oviduct. Well, sometimes, especially in young birds or older birds that are at the end of their egg laying stage, um, they might pop out two ovum. And unfortunately in the wild, typically um, both of these eggs do not survive. Um, okay, so I have to start this. We're gonna start talking about development within the egg, um, incubation. And before I talk about this, I need to read you my favorite fa favorite quote. It means so much to me because I have incubated and worked with a lot of bird eggs and chicks now in my life. And so I think that if required on pain of death to name instantly the most perfect thing in the universe, I should risk my fate on a bird's egg. Um, I absolutely love that statement, that quote. Uh, this is a blackback gull chick who is pipping, breaking through the egg. This was on a nest in Maine. Beautiful eggshell. And why I love that quote is because it's so, so true. When you think about it, an eggshell is made up of calcium carbonate, collagen fibers, crystalline calcite. It has a protein cuticle that covers it to protect it from bacteria and from excessive amounts of moisture or water getting into the egg. And did you know that when a female is producing an egg within her body, depending on the species, over 12% of that female's own bone calcium is transferred to that egg. So imagine, this is a huge metabolic cost. Not only does this female um, transfer her own resources, but she needs to be eating really well to keep up with it. And so an egg is a delicate balance. It's this, it's this most delicate structure that needs to be fragile enough so a chick like this black neck stilt can hatch, can break out of the egg, yet it needs to be rigid and strong enough that the parents can actually incubate it to transfer heat. So truly it's brilliant. I can't think of anything that is more perfect. I love this photo. These are SFBBO photos, um, a truly delicate balance. And so now you learned how uh, the egg is produced within the body and how long it can take. And so what happens when the egg is laid? Um, so some species of birds develop a brood patch and so this is basically an area on, you can see here, this is the bird's, believe it or not, the bird looks headless, um, but this is a chest and an abdomen. And so what happens is some species of birds, when they go into egg laying condition, hormones um, cause their feathers to fall out on their chest and abdomen. And then they get this vascular area. It's kind of like, feels like a really warm blister. And so this allows direct transfer of heat from the bird to the egg. Because imagine a bird's feathers are the most natural and best insulators on the planet. So feathers against an egg aren't going to produce as much warmth because the warmth is being trapped into the body from the feathers. So an ecological strategy or evolutionary st strategy is that you lose those feathers um, and then you can transfer direct heat to the eggs. So it really is br brilliant. 
And as a wildlife rehabber, this is something we look for in the summer months if we get a bird in our care. We're always looking for brood patches because we know that that would be an incubating female or male that has either eggs or is brooding young. And we want to get them back uh, sooner rather than later so they can get back to their young. So it's really important to us. Um, but not all birds develop a brood patch. My most favorite bird on the planet is the northern gannet. Uh, this is an adult and with a juvenile gannet. Uh, unrelated, but we put them together and of course the baby immediately started begging to the adult and the adult wanted nothing to do with it, <laughs> but we can always hope. Um, but anyway, in the case of gannets and all the birds in um, Pelicaniformes, that order, the gannets, the pelicans, the cormorants, the tropic birds, uh, they actually use their fabulous feet to incubate their eggs. So you can see here, um, this large foot is actually very vascular and very warm, and they um, gently uh, sit on their eggs with their feet. And so that is their direct heat transfer, not through a brood patch, but through these awesome feet. And there, there are many different um, strategies for incubating and brooding chicks. Okay. Um, so let's look inside the egg now and see what is happening. So um, this is all so, so important. This is a tiny little American robin, by the way, who had just hatched. And so if you were to look into a chicken egg, you would see a yolk. You would see an airspace on the blunt side of the egg. You would see little white strings that attach um, the yolk to each end of the egg on the inside. Um, and all of these structures have really important meaning. Uh, for one, if you look at your chicken egg that you buy at the store that is not fertilized, you are going to see a little white spot on the top of the yolk. And that is called, when it's not fertilized, when the egg's not fertilized, we call it a blasto disc. When it is fertilized, we call it a blastoderm. But your chicken eggs from the store are not going to be fertilized, so they're going to be a little white spot. The yolk serves as the food source for the developing chick within the egg. Um, when the chick is developing, the adults are turning the eggs. And this is to ensure that heat is distributed evenly uh, while they're incubating and also to make sure that membranes and structures within the eggs are not sticking, nothing's drying out. Um, also, these little springs, what they do, because of the differences in, in weights of the various components of the egg, when the adults are turning the egg, these strings always keep this germinal spot, the chick that's developing, it always keeps them on top. And this is really important because if you were a hatching chick and you were face down um, and then you break into the world, you might be drowned by amniotic fluid or whatever else is happening. And so the chick always needs to stay on top, um, basically on top of the yolk. They can't be under the pressure of the yolk. And I hope that makes sense because I'm breezing through it. But due to the different viscosity of the structures in here, um, and these spring-like structures, um, the chick will stay on the top of the yolk, and that is so important. Whoops. I had to include this. This was um, some, some of my eggs smiling at me one day. <laughs> um, but also you can see, see these little white springs? These are um, the chalaza that I was just talking about, which allow um, the egg to rotate and keep the chick on top of the yolk in the egg. And here's the close-up. So here's that little blastoderm. Um, and this is the un um, unfertilized egg. I'm sorry. So blastodisc. For some reason, that word's really hard for me to say always. And these are the spring-like structures here that I was talking about. So really interesting. I hope, I hope that you'll look at your breakfast eggs and, and that they'll have some new meaning. Uh, so what happens is when the egg is laid, it doesn't have a chick in it 
because development only takes place when birds start incubating their eggs. They need to um, incubate and bring them up to a certain temperature and then the development begins. And so depending on the species, um, you know, owls and hawks, they are asynchronous nesters, which means that they'll start incubating their eggs as soon as the first egg is laid. And then all the chicks hatch at different times. We've all seen photos of that owls in a nest and there's, you know, little ones and then there's big ones and um, the little ones often don't survive if there's not enough food. And then you have birds like songbirds and waterfowl who um, they do not start incubating their eggs until they've laid the second to last egg. And that's because they want everyone to develop at the same time. So they're less vulnerable. They take care of them all at once. They all leave the nest all at once. Um, and um, basically it's safer that way for those species. And we'll explain that because I'm going to talk about the different types of development in birds. Um, so here we have a bird. Development has started. And within the egg, what's happening is absolutely fascinating. So here's your embryo sitting on top of the yolk. This looks like the earth, but this is actually the yolk. And that yolk is um, the food, the entire nutrients for this developing embryo within the egg. Here is the blunt side of the egg that has an air space, which I'm going to show you what that looks like. Um, but also all these little dots are representing um, basically air spaces, um, you know, porous sections of the membranes. And so what's happening is within the egg, the chick is not breathing with, with its lungs, believe it or not. It's not breathing with its lungs. What's happening is there is passive respiration with an exchange for carbon dioxide through um, the porous shell in the porous membranes. Um, this is what's so cool because I had never, I remember when I first started looking into this, I couldn't believe that these birds aren't actually breathing. It's passive respiration. They're not using their lungs. And so this little chick who looks like an alien is surrounded by amniotic fluid, just like a human baby. Um, all these components, the eggs being rolled so that everything is warmed thoroughly and consistently. And then look at this. So this is really cool. Um, this right here, this sac, this is called the allantoy sac or allantoic sac. And you can see it goes into the, the bottom half of the embryo. And this is because this is the poop sac. And this is where it's important. Remember I was saying that birds don't have bladders except for the ostrich? This is because, first of all, imagine this little chick. If it had a bladder in this egg, it would need massive quantities of water um, to rid itself of the ammonia, but also the ammonia in this confined egg would reach toxic levels in no time. So instead, um, the uric acid, nitrogenous waste, basically is it's here, it's collected here in this poop sac. And when the chick hatches, this becomes, this ends up being the large intestine. So this is an early analog of the large intestine. And the yolk gets absorbed um, as the chick grows in the egg. And if you see a newly hatched chick, it actually has a little umbilical stump, a little umbilical belly button. And that is the yolk sac that has been absorbed. So fascinating the most fully contained, perfect unit, um, passive respiration, and um, even a poop sac. It's pretty cool, isn't it? It's really amazing. And so um, here's a chick, an example of a chick developing within the egg. So it starts here, it's on top of the yolk. Here you can really see like all the vasculars, vas vascularization, and also um, there's passive breathing here. The chick's not using its lungs. What happens next is when the chick is ready to hatch from the eggshell, this is when it finally, it penetrates the airspace. And this is when the chick, it swallows um, the remaining amniotic fluid that it's been surrounded by, okay, right here in the amnion, swallows that and then breathes with its lungs for the first time. And so this is also why it's important. Imagine if the bird was upside down. 
um, hatching wouldn't be able to happen. And so typically most birds, they actually stop turning their, their eggs within three to four days prior to hatch because the chicks, they um, put themselves into a perfect hatching position, which you can see here, which is sort of rolled up with one foot over the wing. Here's the rest of the yolk squeezed in. Um, and then the chick is in this sideways position. And it's ideal for hatching because it allows them to bump, um, basically bump uh, with their ankles and um, peck with their beak. So they get through the airspace, they, take a, they swallow the fluid, they take a breath, and now is the hardest part. It could be, depending on the species, it could be 24 or more hours before they actually break out of the eggshell. And they do that by, again, bumping with their feet and hammering with their beak. And most birds develop a little egg tooth, which is this little calcium deposit on the tip of the bill, which helps them to crack through the egg. Most birds, it either falls off in the next few days or it's um, absorbed into their beak. But here you can see these were American robins and starting that pipping process where there's a little hole and you can hear them peeping. It's one of the most beautiful things to hatch eggs. And so here's our, our yolk again, our breakfast yolk, which is not fertilized because you're buying it from the store. You all know this is the blasto disc, unfertilized germinal spot where the chick will grow from and then the chick absorbs that entire yolk. These are the chalaza, which allow the adults to turn the eggs and the yolk. Um, the chick is always on top of the yolk. And this is what the airspace looks like. Even in your unfertilized chicken egg, it starts with this airspace, which is where the chick um, breaks through before it finally breaks through the shell and enters the world. It's so cool and honestly incredible. I mean, how does it even really happen? <laughs> Um, and so this is just another graphic, but it shows you that hatching position, which I love. So it's sort of a wing. Oh, it's a, I always forget, but this picture sums it up beautifully. Um, a little ankle to be banging on the shell, um, banging on the shell with a wing and a beak. And it gets them out. This is a chicken. This is another just really basic illustration of the growth of a chicken, a white leghorn in the shell. Um, and I loved this. This was something that I learned from working at SFBBO with um, their Snowy Plover program is that because of that airspace, so what's happening is the airspace actually, it gets larger as the chick develops. And this is not because it's actually getting larger. It's because the chick um, that is growing is pulling those membranes allowing for more of a space at the blunt end of the egg. And that's important because you now know that that's when they break through that airspace, that's the first time they're really breathing with their lungs. So I learned at SFBBO that this is a way um, you can actually determine when you have an egg, you can determine in some cases what the development is in that egg um, because you can put eggs in distilled water and don't do this at home, but you can put eggs in distilled water and then they will float according to their airspace. Um, basically, the theory, you know, the larger the airspace, the more upright, the more buoyant that egg is going to be on the blunt end. And so if you have a chart that tells you, um, you know, what's how much rotation there should be for a snowy plover egg, um, that helps you to determine uh, how far along they are in development. And this is important because imagine working out in the field and you find a nest of four eggs and you have no idea when they laid those eggs. And some eggs are so pigmented, it's impossible to candle them. And so egg flotation is sometimes the only thing that works. And some of you might be saying, well, how the heck do you put an egg in water? Doesn't it get just immersed with water? And the answer is no. Um, so again, uh, Eggshells are extremely porous, but also they have this protein cuticle on the outside, which prevents excessive amounts of moisture uh, to come into the eggshell. And so unless eggs are just sitting, you know, if you dunk an egg in water, yes, eventually the water is going to penetrate it. But if the water is, if the egg is just in water for seconds, it's absolutely fine. Um, and also this, 
always brings me to a point where if you're in European countries, a lot of people do not refrigerate the eggs that they eat. And this is because they are not washing their eggs. Here in the United States, all of our eggs are cleaned and sterilized because we want them perfectly white or perfectly brown and we don't want poop on them. And when they're sterilized, um, the eggs no longer have this protein cuticle, which prevents bacteria from getting inside. So for our eggs, we have to stick them into the refrigerator, whereas in some other countries, they have eggs you know, out on their counters for days and weeks and they are fine. So just a really interesting fact. I want to show you what it looks like when you're candling an egg and every egg's different because a robin egg, for example, doesn't have any markings on it. Yes, it's a brilliant blue, but with a really good egg candler, you can see through it. Whereas some eggs like osprey, for example, that are um, darker and deeply pigmented, it's really hard to see through those eggs. So I just wanted to show you, this is what um, it looks like when I can't, you know, when I candle an American robin egg. I love this video because you can really see it. So this is a, you can see all the vascular branching, which I showed you, all those blood vessels, which I showed you in some of the illustrations. And then you can see the, the embryo moving in there. You can see the airspace. It's still very small because this is a, ver this is a young bird. Um, as chicks develop, they fill up the whole egg, which I just showed you with that sideways hatching position. So you can't see through them or you can't see anything when you're candling an egg that is later in development. The good thing is with later in development eggs, you can often do the flotation test or um, sometimes you can hear them. Uh, inside of the egg, which is to me one of the most beautiful things I've ever experienced in life is to hear the peeping from inside of the egg. And then you can't wait to see them. I'll just play that again because it's I think it's really extraordinary. So that's the little robin's head moving around in there. And I love when it's this easy. Most of the time it's a lot of guesswork. Um, we finally invested in a hundred dollar egg candling flashlight. And at first I was like $100 for a flashlight, <laughs> but it, it, it has made a world of a difference. We go into a dark closet and then I can determine what's happening in that egg. And of course, for us in a rehab setting, a lot of the eggs we receive are not viable. You know, they've been, a predator got into the nest and someone found the eggs on the ground or they're cracked or, um, but we do try. We typically don't, uh, incubate songbird eggs just because the likelihood of survival, even if they do hatch, is very low. Um, but certainly um, precocial eggs, so birds like um, geese and ducks and turkeys, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. If we get in more than two eggs, um, we will, for a clutch, we will incubate them. And there are reasons for that. Um, the precocial species tend to imprint more readily on people. And so we don't like to incubate single eggs because there's a high risk of that bird hatching and imprinting on us. But if it's two or more eggs, we will incubate them because then they can imprint on each other. I hope that makes sense. These are all the ethical decisions that I have to make as a, as a wildlife hospital director. Um, something else you should know, so you know about the, the hatching position where they tuck in and they peck and they get uh, develop an egg tooth. And so also uh, most baby birds develop what's called a hatching muscle. And this is just a, a transient feature. It goes away. Um, this uh, musculature goes away, but initially it helps birds to peck out of the eggs. So they have like a superpower where they have these amazing mu muscles on their neck uh, to help them get out of the egg. It's pretty incredible. They, um, they basically become, it becomes absorbed and they become other muscles. This is a baby woodcock, by the way, super cute, with a stuffed killdeer, but we didn't have a woodcock. <laughs> we didn't have a plush woodcock. We try, we try. Um, and so here's an example of pipping. And this is where the birds have already broken through the airspace and now they are trying to get out of the shell. And what will first happen is they make this little, um, this little hole in the egg and we refer to this as pipping. We would say the bird has pipped 
And then it's a waiting game. These guys are just so beautiful, black back gulls. I also like to point out that, so now you know that the birds always hatch out of their egg by pecking through the blunt side of the egg. That's really important because um, if you are like me, I'm always coming across birds and eggs and things in nature, and I love to try to solve the puzzles. So if you are out and you find a bunch of eggs on the ground and they have holes in them, and you're wondering, oh my God, did they hatch or were they predated? Um, well, this will be helpful to you. So you can see here, so you know the chick was bumping the egg and then hatched out of the blunt side. Um, when eggs hatch normally, you are always gonna see what looks like their tops have popped off, if that makes sense. And that's because they're pipping from the blunt side of the egg. And so if you find eggs and the narrow side of the egg is open or the middle of the egg is open with the eggs aren't cracked open, then you know you have a predation because um, they can only hatch out of the blunt side of the egg. And so it looks like this when they hatch. And often the membranes like you see here, uh, will be curled in. It's really, it really interesting. It's fun to solve that puzzle. I did come across a nest of mallard eggs once, and unfortunately they were all in the nest, but they had been predated, and I thought they had hatched, but literally the hole, the holes in the eggs were, were like right in the middle of the egg. The eggs weren't cracked in half, it was just a hole, and so that's a sign of predation. Um, so eggshells, totally fabulous and totally functional. And there are so many different types of eggs, uh, the shapes, the colors, the sizes. And I've only shared a few here tonight because we could do a whole presentation just on eggs. Um, but some eggs of note are the eggs of um, MERS, for example. Uh, MERS, depending on where they live, um, they have these incredibly camouflaged eggs that are also pyroform in shape, sort of top shape and long. And here are just a few examples, depending on geographically where these birds nest. Uh, and these are cliff nesting birds throughout their range. Um, but depending also on, you know, the vegetation that's around, they'll have these amazing colors and spots and scrawls just so beautiful. And there's been a lot of research done into why would birds have these top shaped eggs. And so for the longest time, it was believed that if you're a bird like a mer or a dovekey or a razorbill or a puffin, and you are nesting on the edge of cliffs, um, that you'll have these long top shaped eggs, because if an egg gets bumped, it's going to spin in a circle instead of spinning off the cliff. And there is some val validity to that, absolutely. But also they found when your eggs are top shaped, if you put them, <laughs> if you have them in the nest all pointed together, um, then you can actually facilitate heat transfer more efficiently to all of them because they're tucked in together in like this nice little puzzle, if that makes sense, all with a pointy end uh, pointing down. And so um, that is also valid. But more recently, they have determined that uh, birds that are more aer aerodynamic, whether that's underwater <laughs> um, or in the air, typically have longer eggs, these pyroform shaped eggs. And I think I took a quote about that. It's really, really, I thought it was really, really interesting. Um, Let's see, birds that are really good flyers tend to lay asymmetric or elliptical eggs, except for penguins. And so the exception they believe is that they have long legs because they have streamlined bodies for swimming. I don't know about that, that might be pushing it, but um, so basically uh, the efficiency of heat transfer, not having your eggs roll off a cliff, and then also more room for those long wings. Um, cormorants also have really long eggs, and that is also believed to be related to, they have a long pelvic cavity, and that is related to swimming. They're incredibly efficient uh, divers and have propulsion underwater. Woodpeckers, I'm sure you all know, many of them have round white eggs, 
And this is because these are cavity nesters. So they don't have to worry about eggs rolling off a cliff. They don't have to worry about predators finding eggs. So they don't have to be cryptically marked. And so they just often have white round eggs in their nest cavity. Um, thrushes typically nest in trees, um, especially, especially birds like our American robin. And a lot of those birds have eggs that are shades of blue. And you might think, you know, blue would stick out like a sore thumb. But the theory is if you are a predator looking down through the tree canopy, um, that blue is actually just interpreted as space. And it kind of makes sense when you think about it. So blue wouldn't be seen um, because it just takes up the form of space looking through canopy vegetation. And shorebirds have top shaped eggs also um, to facilitate that good uh, heat transfer. Imagine if you're a little plover and you have these really round and top shaped eggs and if you can have all of them pointing down in a nest um, then you can get your tiny little body around them to facilitate heat transfer more easily. And so here are just a few examples. This is a, a cavity nester and these were from California and um, I believe this was a Buick's wren, which is interesting to me because it does have markings and this is a cavity nesting bird, but the markings do match the vegetation. Um, oops, excuse me. And notice they're round. Again, cavity nesters, they don't have to worry about eggs rolling away. These are very round. These are your chestnut back chickadee, which is also a cavity nester. And these are bluebird eggs. Uh, sadly, these birds, this is when I was working for Audubon and Cupertino, and we went through a terrible, terrible storm and cold spell. And um, these eggs were close to development. You can see um, the airspace was very large and the chicks were about to hatch. And unfortunately, the parents had abandoned, we believed related to you know, on a, no food sources being around because of inclement weather. So that was really unfortunate, but beautiful eggs nonetheless. Here's another example of um, those sort of pyroform, those long eggs. And these are definitely, you know, probably one of the most efficient flyers on the planet, uh, the swifts. And so this is a bird that nests precariously by building this little stick nest, which is glued to the inside of a chimney or a rock wall. wall. Um, and then they have these eggs, which could easily roll off or be disturbed. And so it sort of makes sense why they would have those long eggs. And so, um, some a few egg facts. So most species, as I mentioned, it takes them 24 to 48 hours to produce an egg. And now you can understand why you can see all the work that goes into these eggs um, just metabolically. And so uh, the ratites and also penguins and raptors, those are larger birds. And it typically takes them four to eight days between egg laying. So they would lay an egg every four to eight days or so. The boobies and hornbills typically take seven days. The kiwis sort of take the cake um, in the egg department in that they lay two enormous 500 gram eggs at four week intervals. And if you were to take an x-ray of a kiwi while she has an egg inside of her, you would see that the egg takes up 25% of the female's entire body mass. So talk about talk about a physical demand, um, but also kiwis don't fly. And so they can do this. They can take, you know, four weeks to produce an egg inside of them and it's not weighting them down because they don't have to fly. And then ostriches, of course, they lay 1900 gram eggs. And the hummingbirds on the opposite end of the spectrum, um, their eggs weigh about 0.2 grams and they lay them again within usually a 24 hour period. I absolutely adore, this is one of my favorite SFBVO photos where we were doing um, a California gull breeding bird survey in Alviso, and one of the gulls had french fries in its nest, <laughs> which is just awesome. <laughs> Love the gulls. Okay, so um, the last pieces that I want to talk about is the types of avian development. So now you know what reproductive anatomy looks like, how birds um, reproduce, how eggs are created, how the chick develops within the egg, but not all chicks are the same. And so we need to talk about the different types of development. Um, and so here is a Carolina wren. 
And they are what we refer to as altricial. And so the songbirds typically are altricial, which means when they hatch, they are naked, blind, and completely helpless. And so here's a little hatchling American robin, and you can see the tiny little egg tooth there uh, that hasn't fallen off yet. So this bird is just a few days old. And what happens with hatchlings, you know, the songbirds are altricial, meaning that they have a very short incubation period because then the birds hatch all at the same time and all the development occurs in the nest. So when you think about songbirds, like the American robin, the incubation is typically 12 to 14 days. That's really short. Um, that's because when the chick comes out of the egg, they are naked, blind, and helpless, totally dependent on the parents. And so, um, you know, American robins, then they're in the nest growing as nestlings here and don't leave the nest until about 14 days or so. And then the, even so the parents have to continue to feed them for a week or so. So that's um, very risky development in that you have to hope that you are not predated, uh, that your nest or chicks are not predated while they're developing. And then of course, when songbirds fly, many of them when they leave the nest can't even fly for the first seven or so days of life. Um, their primary feathers are still growing in. So uh, life is really hard if you're a songbird and if you're an altricial bird in general. And I need to show this brilliant example um, from Va, who was a volunteer at SFBBO when I was there. She took a photo series of a dark-eyed junco. This is your uh, Oregon junco. And um, here was day one when they hatched. So naked, blind, and helpless. Day two, eyes have opened, strong enough to hold up their little bobbleheads and beg for food, still naked, blind, and helpless. Day three, look at the difference. Here we have, you know, little aliens, little bug eyes, barely, you can see the feather tracks, but still barely any da down. Day three, we're seeing feather tracks on the wings. We're seeing down. Um, we're seeing pin feathers, I mean. It's um, a remarkable difference. Day four, um, they really have pin feathers now. Day five, pin feathers are starting to erupt. I don't know if you can see some of the brown feathering erupting on the back. Um, we missed day six, but day seven, they're actually starting to look like birds. And look at this. This is fabulous. Characteristic of your Oregon junco and also my slate-colored junco on the East Coast. Um, they have white outer tail feathers, which is so fun, especially when you're trying to identify uh, baby birds that look like everything else. Sometimes uh, the only thing that helps is looking at those outer tail feathers or even the outer tail follicles, which you can see here are already white. Um, so this is day seven, they're looking like real birds. And then we skipped a few days and by day 10, they are starting to exhibit, uh, you know, the normal behavior for that age, which is to hunker down when a predator is near the nest. They look like birds, they're almost fully feathered. And by 12, day 12, they are gone. So it's a really quick development for songbirds. And this is also why when people call us and say, oh my God, I have an American robin nesting on my front deck and it can't be there because I need to use the front door. Well, we kindly say, you know, could you wait 14 days and also take photos and enjoy the process because it's really quick. And for us, it's just a blip in time, a minor interruption compared with everything that those birds have done to produce these young. Um, not to mention how, how um, physically expensive it is to produce the nests. Um, so it's a lot of work that goes into a baby bird. This is a photo of an Oregon junco and I just had to include it because it's adorable. <laughs> So what are the other types of development? So how about precocial nesting? For example, here I use mallards. So birds that nest precocially are your waterfowl, um, your gallinaceous birds, which means that your chickens and your turkeys and your, your grouse, then also your grebes and rails and your megapodes, which we're gonna talk about here in a minute. We do not have megapodes in the United States, um, but precocial means when these young hatch, 
they are eyes open, covered in down, able to thermoregulate to some degree, um, and can eat on their own. They just need to have a mother um, or parents, depending on the species, um, to follow around and learn how. So these birds, like they come out of the egg and then they're they're ready to go. The difference is, whereas an American robin will have a 14 day incubation, a mallard will have a 29 day incubation because there's a whole lot more happening inside of that egg while it's being incubated. And so obviously there are risks associated with that because if you have a nest on the ground for 29 days, obviously you're incredibly vulnerable um, and not just your babies, but you, if you're incubating them. Um, so really, really interesting. And I had to include the megapodes because they're just absolutely ridiculous. So these are birds, they are um, Australasian birds, things like your Australian brush turkey. And what happens is, there's zero parental care. <laughs> okay, so in the case of a mallard, once the male and female mate, the female um, lays all the eggs, obviously, and the male leaves her when she lays the second to last egg. Then once she lays the second to last egg, she starts incubating her whole clutch. The male leaves, no parental care. And this is the case for most ducks, honestly. The males ain't got nothing to do with it. Um, the megapodes, um, totally different. There's no parental care, zero. And what happens is the female lay the females lay their eggs in literally this pile of rotting vegetation. It's like a volcano of rotting vegetation. Um, and the male comes back and he adds to that pile, and it basically it self incubates. So the chicks incubate in this rotting compost pile. Um, and then when the chicks emerge, when they hatch, they are fully feathered, they are flighted, and they are completely precocial. They can feed themselves and they don't even need parents. Isn't that mind blowing? If I was gonna come back as a bird, I want to be a megapode mother. <laughs> because there's just zero involvement. <laughs> uh, I think it's fascinating. And I'm sorry I didn't put a picture in. Please look up um, Australian brush turkey. And let me just see, I printed out. Uh, yeah, they're chicken-like birds with small heads and large feet. The family Megapodidae, and the name literally means large foot. It's in reference to the heavy legs and feet typical of these terrestrial birds. Most of them are brown or black in color. And, um, their chicks hatch from their eggs in the most mature condition of any bird on the planet. Eyes open, ready to go, fully feathered, able to fly, able to run. Um, and yeah, they're found in Australasian regions. Just really, really cool. Okay, so what are examples of semi-precocial birds? So a semi-precocial species means birds like gulls and terns where they hatch, their eyes are open, they are downy and can thermoregulate to some degree. However, they are completely dependent on the parents and choose to stay at their nest even though they're mobile um, for several days. So California gulls, they're like one of the cutest things you could ever see on the planet. Eyes open, downy, they don't need mom and dad there all the time, um, but they need mom and dad to feed them. And the same with terns, and I absolutely love this photo. So common terns obviously are dependent, you know, the, the food prey is largely fish. Here on the East Coast, it's largely uh, the sand lance. And that takes, that acquires some skill to hunt. And so these chicks are dependent on the parents actually through their southbound migration. So young tern chicks that are leaving us right now, um, they follow the parents and the parents have to continue feeding them for through the first part of their southbound journey until they acquire the skills to hunt efficiently. Um, I think that's really, really fascinating. Talk about an investment. Um, I also just want to point out before we finish up that I often think about this, now you understand how challenging it is for birds to raise young, how challenge, challenging it is 
physically for them to produce eggs, then incubate them, build nests, reproduce. All of this takes so much time and so many resources. And so to me, it's devastating, especially when you have endangered species like snowy plovers and piping plovers, where a nest is predated. And then the next nest that that female produces, it usually doesn't have as many eggs because she has already invested all of her resources into that first clutch. And then sometimes they don't have as many eggs or they do lay as many eggs, but not all of them are viable. And so it's really, really sad. And of course, some of this takes place for natural reasons, but in my field of work, most of what I see um, is human impact. And so, you know, when we've lost a piping plover nest because of a dog, I think about that entire life cycle um, of what that male and female invested into that nest. Um, it's just, it's really, really sad. I just think of it very, very differently after knowing what these birds need to do. And I know they're not doing it intentionally. Their genetics tell them to breed and to care for the young. Um, but still, it's such an important part of their life, life cycle. Um, okay, so another type of development in birds is called semi-altricial. So we had the altricial, the precocial, the semi-precocial, the super-precocial, the megabodes, and now we have the semi-altricial. This is a great horned owl. This is a ridiculous, ridiculous bird, um, a red-shouldered hawk <laughs> who we get this year. It had fallen 40 feet from its nest. Uh, miraculously was unharmed, but had a lot of intestinal parasites. So we treated it and we got it back into its nest um, with the help of a tree company. But I love the photo because he just looks like a little Muppet. Um, but anyway, semi-altricial refers primarily to the raptors. And so these are birds that are, they are confined to their nest for long periods of time. They're very dependent on the adults. So young owls, and I believe most young hawks, when they hatch, they are downy. They are dependent on, uh, it's typically the female who is brooding them to keep them warm. They can thermoregulate to some degree, not for long periods of time, and their eyes are closed. A great horned owl, for example, doesn't open their eyes until day 10, and they are completely dependent on the parents for feeding them, providing them protection, and then once they, they branch, they leave the nest, and then once they fledge, the adults are still feeding them for several weeks. So this is like the extreme, <laughs> the extreme in, excuse me, bird care is if you are a semi-altricial bird. And I just have a quick story that this summer, um, I received some killdeer eggs into my care. And what had happened was a woman had found a nest in Maine. I'm in Massachusetts. She found two eggs on the ground in Maine and she thought that they were abandoned because there weren't any parents there. And she took them home with her to Massachusetts and she bought an incubator and she incubated them. And first of all, everything I just told you is illegal. Um, also, it is a migratory bird. <laughs> um, they're protected under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Also, you just learned that depending on the species, shorebirds are precocial, which means that uh, the female does not start incubating until she lays typically the last egg. Um, and so it was normal that there was no adult with the nest of two eggs because she wouldn't have started incubating yet. Okay, so there's all that. And then this woman calls and says she has two eggs. She has no idea what the heck they are. Um, but they're hatching. And she was about two hours away from me. So I had to arrange a really precarious transport. We have federal permits and state permit, you know, to take care of migratory species. And then I had these two eggs, uh, which they had pipped. They had like a tiny little star in there, in the blunt end of their eggshell. And I could hear them peeping. Um, and it was so stressful for me because you just don't know. You know, they were hatching under less than ideal conditions. They now went from one incubator to my incubator after being in a car for two hours in an incubator. And so 
Um, I consulted with a wonderful egg expert who's on the West Coast, and she walked me through it. And I learned so much about um, respiration, you know, how often they're peeping, how often they're breathing, and when they need help. And so I'm happy to say it took over 48 hours since they had pipped for them to, to finally come out of their eggshells. Um, and they came out. And then the next part was even more challenging, which is getting baby kill deer to eat uh, in, in a rehab setting without having parents. And so sometimes we get really creative here. I took um, a piping plover plush and I put two rings on its neck, <laughs> hoping that it would look like a kill deer. <laughs> Um, and you can see here, I was talking about, so the blunt end, the top came off, the membranes are turned inward, everything's normal, um, and these two birds did well um, and were later released. So that was a success story, but it was also a very stressful one for me because it was like, when do I help? They're not out yet. When do I help? Um, and so in sometimes helping is not the best thing because you can do more harm than good. So I'm thrilled that they actually hatched. And I'm just going to check my time. I don't know if we have time for this slide, so I'm going to skip on. Um, and I just want to say thank you so much for attending. I hope that that was informative and not too um, technical, and I hope that you all learned something. Stephanie, thank you so much. That was so fascinating. I definitely learned more about avian reproduction than I thought I ever would. So <laughs> thank you. Um, now we do have a few questions, so we can totally get to those. Um, sure. I did see that someone asked uh, for when uh, birds are laying eggs, are they laid blunt end first? Um, that's a great question. You know, I don't think I've ever thought about that, but I, I think they are laid blunt end first. And, and also in the nest, because the chick pecks through the air sac first, eggs will always be slightly upright on the blunt end. And that's something that we have to do when we're incubating eggs here is make sure they're slightly upright on the blunt end. Okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I, we have a lot of thank yous in the chat window. We have someone oh, who said it wasn't too technical at all. <laughs> and it's great. Yeah, just a lot of a lot of compliments for you. So thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, we do have a question from Jan, who you know, of course. Um, in songbirds, often individual eggs can get fertilized by different fathers. Is there a uh, sperm storage in birds, or does a male sneak in? Um, yes, that's a great question. So males, I know some birds will actually produce um, a male will produce like a mucus plug in the female's cloaca to prevent other males, but sometimes the female or another male will peck it out. And from what I understand, there is storm, there is sperm storage. And so um, what happens is when they mate, you know, the most current male, usually that is the first to be, to fertilize. And then of course they're, they're laying usually multiple eggs. And so you might have all different genetics in there. I could be wrong, but that's the last I've read. Um, so sort of, so the most recent breeding will displace the previous breeding. Yeah, very interesting. And then a question from Sarah is, I heard that when hatchlings leave the nest, they are already adult size. So it's, it's okay to ban them uh, because their legs don't get bigger. Is that true? Yes, that's totally true. Thank goodness. <laughs> Yeah, so sometimes we are able to uh, actually ban little chicks too um, once they've they fledged. Um, and then another question is, how can a novice who is interested in development, especially after this presentation, get involved and learn more or be involved firsthand? Oh, great question. I would say, so the a place where you're going to see a lot of baby birds would probably be your local wildlife rehabilitation hospital. So a place like the Wildlife Center of Silicon Valley, I'm not sure if Peninsula Humane Society is still doing um, bird rehab. Also, you have International Bird Rescue. Um, oh, so many places. Um, there's NAR. So I would say get involved with re rehabbers who do songbirds. 
Veronica Bowers is amazing. She's probably the songbird goddess um, of the United States, and she is Sonoma County, Sonoma County Wild Bird Center. I should know that. And so, yes, I mean, that is how I learned about all these babies, and you learn to identify them, like, from their down and their skin color and their their sounds and their gape color and their mouth color, you know, their flange color. It's like full immersion of baby birds. <laughs> Yeah, very cool. And I know that it's an intensive process to to help care for baby birds, so I'm sure the help is needed. Um, yeah. Terry also mentioned native songbird care and conservation in Sebastopol as a potential option. So thanks for sharing that. Uh, and then another question from Terry is, penguins have a different body shape. Is mating and egg production still the same? Um, I've never thought about penguins mating. I know they don't have brood patches. Um, I would think that they would mate the same. I would think they would lay on their, one would lay on its belly <laughs> because they're so upright. I'm afraid I don't know. And now I'm gonna Google that as soon as I'm finished. <laughs> Great question. Yeah, I'm sure we're all gonna Google that now. <laughs> Um, all right. Well, I think that was the last question that I'm seeing right now. If anyone has any last second questions, please go ahead and enter those in really quickly. But um, for now, I do want to reiterate my huge appreciation and gratitude to Stephanie for giving this talk. And of course, for all the work that you do to help birds and other wildlife um, that you, you know, you've been doing this for so long. So thank you so much. Um, Stephanie, is there anything you want to say to everybody? Um, I just want to say thank you and thank you for supporting SFBVO. Yeah, and thank you again. Um, and if folks want to support wild care as well, we do encourage that. Um, of course, Stephanie's been doing a lot of great work there. So, um, oh, we have one last question here. Does laying eggs hurt? Um, I don't think so. I mean, of, cor of course, birds can't tell us. And if you have chickens, you know that they can become very vocal when they're laying. Um, but I would think that because they lay so often, I would hope that it wouldn't hurt. Um, I think when it does hurt is when you have situations where um, the egg has broken inside of them, or when you have egg bound females who can't push the eggs out because they have soft shells, it's when there's abnormalities, um, I don't know for sure, but I would hope that something that you lay every 24 hours would not hurt. <laughs> Great questions. I'm gonna look these up for the next talk. <laughs> All right, yeah, thanks again, everybody for those great questions again for this presentation and for of course sticking around um, extra time basically for a, a great presentation. So again, thanks everybody. We hope to see you again at a future event and thanks again for supporting our California Fall Challenge fundraiser. Have a great rest of your evening. Mm -hmm.